Well, um, yeah, the, the name of the game is Conversations here, so feel free to jump in and ask questions and challenge our presenters here. But uh, other than that, I will uh, turn the show over to them and do their thing. Sure. We'll get a quick interview of ourselves. Yep. So, so I'm Rebecca Berry, uh, principal and president of Triangle and Alexander Architects. And I'm Tony Chung, principal and director of design. I'm Alexander Architects. Great to have you all here today. Yeah. So, um, the project that we are now really presenting is a project in Tulsa, Oklahoma, for a congregation that has a place for But by way of kind of getting to the project, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about it. Is okay. sort of type of work because this is really um, the next in a series of projects that the firm has done in this space for Jewish congregations and groups really all around the country. Um, so, an interesting thing, you know, kind of in the life of a practice, right, is how things evolve and change and how you get your work, right, and how you move from working in one place to another. And really for the firm, you know, the vast majority of our work is here in New England, you know, Boston, Massachusetts, a bit beyond kind of thing. But this practice is different for us because it is national, nationally based. Um, so we wanted to give just a little background of sort of how, how that started and how we got to our approach to these buildings. Um, before we kind of talk about this particular project and the aspects of that um, in terms of design. So um, Tony's going to start off with how this all began. <laughs> so I've been for a little while. Um, but I'm from, John, early on we were involved with the Holocaust and Memorial Museum down in Washington, D.C. And from that project, um, in associate with Bank Off Free, we got a call out of the blue one day and said, oh, you guys do, by the way, religious buildings and interior synagogues. And we didn't really. Then we said, sure. <laughs> and it was from Omaha, Nebraska. So they saw involvement with this museum and they reached out to us and then we were hired. And that was over three decades ago. And so from that, we've now probably well over a dozen synagogues around the country from that first project, which began as a result of the Holocaust Museum. Yeah, and that's the, the sort of the built work, right? So additionally, we've, we've been involved with many, many feasibility studies and master planning and, and those types of things. And then the, the dozen or so is kind of like, okay, getting out of the ground and going through, you know, sort of, sort of complete construction. Tony has been involved with every single one of these buildings. <laughs> and I think, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about kind of like how, what our approach to this is um, and where we each kind of come from in terms of how we think about these buildings. Um, but just to talk more generally about um, about the approach to these religious buildings that we take, and in particular, the aspects of the buildings that relate specifically to Judaism and that culture. Um, and this is an interesting thing to think about because just full disclosure, neither of us are Jewish. <laughs> yeah. <Thank you> <laughs> um, but interestingly enough, you know, we both have been at this for a while, and uh, of course, you know, Feingold, um, you know, was really instrumental in kind of bringing this, bring these projects to life. And so, Tony and I worked with him over the years, and I would say, obviously, that he's been, you know, and was a mentor um, to both of us, and he kind of took on. Uh, what we will say is like a new approach to these buildings. There were a lot of synagogues built um, post World War II, 1950s, 1960s, and there was sort of a particular way that they were made, constructed, and set up. And Mo had some feelings about some of that architecture. And so when he got involved with these buildings, you know, that the two of you really kind of tried to take things in a different direction. Yeah, in the post war era, um, a lot of the projects um, were pretty nondescript buildings. Um, in the Jewish faith, they didn't have the same iconography that some other faiths had, so they literally some of the buildings didn't even look like it was just buildings. And there were a lot of challenges in how those buildings were built. Um, yeah. And there were some also really, really beautiful setting out every single building in that era. Yeah. There's some good in particular among others who built across the country, but, we'll but there were some challenges that we, we felt we yeah. needed to address or at least bring yeah. some different sets of buildings. So, yeah. And so, really, like the, we we start with really this idea of what we call the texture of memory, 
thinking about kind of the history of the people over a very long time, right? And so we have these kind of historical antecedents. We think about materiality as it relates to spaces like, you know, the, um, the Western Wall in Jerusalem, as it relates to some of the synagogues in Eastern Europe, as it relates to things like text, which you're going to see us talk a lot about. Um, so sort of as opposed to, say, iconography in, like, if you're used to sort of, you know, Christian churches, um, the use of text is very common in Jewish spaces, which actually... Um, it's also um, can be seen in mosques, for instance, for a lot of the same reasons, which has to do with um, a lack of idols, the idea of the idol, right? So this kind of sense of the materiality and how that permeates its way through the building is something that's very important. Um, additionally, we look at historical antecedents. So this, the black and white photo that you see is actually um, a wooden synagogue from Eastern Europe. Um, there were probably you know, hundreds of these buildings in Poland and Eastern Europe, and they were all basically lost. There are very few left because um, they were lost during the Holocaust and during World War II. Um, and so we have actually, and there's a particular way these buildings are structured, and we often take that as a as a way, again, of thinking about how we arrange spaces in the synagogue. And then, of course, there are other important um, liturgical elements that we'll talk a little bit about, too. This is the, um, the menorah at Yad Vashem uh, in, in Israel. So just to kind of talk about in a sort of like a little bit more personal sense, like where yeah. the two of us come from. So the Holocaust Museum, uh, interesting project when it was um, brought to the attention of Congress, um, one of the key individuals um, in the concentration camp that I could well learn on is in Mazel. And so the Mazel said, we need to really find a way to create memory and not lose sight of what happened. And at that time, there were some smaller areas, I and mean, of course in Israel, uh, this was enough, but not here so much in the United States. So through him and some other key members of Congress and several senators, they said, yeah, we need to create recognition of this. And so they set aside a parcel, which is right next to the Bureau of Printing and Engraving, which is the brick building, which our firm also, interesting enough, was involved in restoring. It's where they print money, where they used to. And so, interesting enough, so they created a site. And one of the reasons we attracted that site originally was that there was a series of close long building that resembled some of the concentration camps. These brick, low, one, two-story structure. And they thought, well, maybe that could be a framework to create a place. But then the project became much bigger. It became a national effort. And then we eventually uh, teamed with Pei Capri and Mo and Jin went and toured through many concentration camps in, in throughout Europe. And so that led to this. And, and really the, the, the idea behind this was this great hall was kind of, in some ways, a recollection of some of the, yeah, in some ways it recalls certain elements of that, but it also did not want to be that sort of very negative and very sort of difficult air. Yeah, so the idea of memory, this hall of pictures, the idea of creating a sense of arrival. And one of the key things for this project we had was the exhibit designer, if he was said, when you come to this museum, we want, you have to leave with more questions than when you enter. So if you have never been to this, what they do is, I think they still do this, they issue you a card. You can track through them, you see what happened to that individual as well. Um, so they're along the way, you can literally see what happened to that person. And unfortunately, 80% of the cases, they got like they killed. So it's a way to personalize this. And so that led to other things. And then the Hall of Memory here, and remember at that time, they had more Holocaust survivors. So they actually had live people that you could speak to about their experience and what it was like. So this all remembrance and became a very powerful way to acknowledge that memory. And that sense of memory and history is, is very much pervasive in the synagogue work. So there's kind of some underpinnings here. Um, I have not been at this as long as today, um, but it has been a while now. <laughs> and uh, this is a, it, talking about memory again, this project is in Deerfield, Illinois, um, and it was the second one that I worked on for the firm. And the interesting thing about this project, um, I think everyone here will remember what happened in late 2008. So we had a shovel in the ground and Lehman Brothers went belly up. And we had to figure out what to do with this building because um, we had this you know, grand 70,000 square foot scheme plan. It was an existing office park. 
congregation was growing, they were moving from one location to another, which often happens. And so, interestingly enough, we built out the first phase and we shelled out the sanctuary. And then we came back a few years later to complete the main worship space. And we had less budget than we did the first time around. <laughs> and so, but time had also passed. And so, interestingly enough, the congregation had had sort of a chance to like be in the space and, and really think about how they wanted to be in the sanctuary. And also, um, the rabbi, as the rabbi would describe it, the initial the initial push had been gifts that were very material, you know, give money to a capital campaign to, to build a building. And then the second time around, it was give gifts of your time, give gifts of yourself. And so um, one of the really, you know, committee members who really made this project happen in many ways, um, he decided that what he wanted to leave as a legacy at the synagogue was what we call the Ner Tamid. So in every Jewish worship space, there is what, what is known as the Nertan Deed, it's the eternal light. And it's meant to signify the presence of God always being there. And Ray, uh, Roy had these sort of really interesting ideas about ideas we wanted to convey with the Nertan Deed. We wanted it to be at a certain scale because we had this very kind of low budget for the space and we wanted each element of the space to have a lot of impact in terms of the design and the feel of the space. So um, it, was, it was a real privilege to like work directly with him on the design of the snare to need. It went from a hand sketch in a meeting where we were all sitting together to locating a glass and metal artist in St. Louis and you know going through and working with samples with them. And and Roy had this idea that this piece would convey the notion of like the harshness of life and the beauty of life all in one piece. And so that the metal was meant to convey the kind of the coldness that can be there. And then of course the glass was meant to convey the beauty. And so we worked through this whole process. You can see, you know, assembling it in place. Um, the guy in the t-shirt there is Roy Splensky. Um, and this is us, you know, getting ready to, to put it up in the space. Um, and, you know, we, we worked through this, this whole process of the samples and everything else. And, and this is the moment, like when you illuminate the light, this is when the space becomes sacred. And, we had been working with these people for close to six years when this happened. You know, I, I consider them friends. Um, the woman in the shawl is rabbi. Uh, recently, she was here from Israel, and we actually went um, had coffee. Um, you know, you develop these kind of, like, deep emotional connections, right, as, as, as when you make, you know, sacred and spiritual spaces for people. So um, this, was a, this was a really kind of powerful element. And if you think about it, it's like it's not – something necessarily that you get to do with architecture, right? Um, we're used to detailing walls and, you know, making beautiful spaces, but to create uh, a sacred object that then, you know, makes a space what it is for people is really, it's really meaningful. And that's, that's kind of, that's the, that's what we're trying to take, like, into all these projects, right? Is that sense of creating a, a space for community where that, that is really, truly their spiritual home. So, to that point, there's this kind of craft, right, to these buildings that is, again, sort of unusual. Um, yeah, we work a lot, um, Rebecca was the artist on that particular kind of light, um, but we work a lot with artists. So one of the things we try to do is you know, design particularly liturgical elements, such as the kind of light, the art curtains, so let's say art doors, um, various elements. These, we have a really good opportunity to engage artists, and I think that's for architects. It's really just not a lot to be able to do that. But I feel like you get a lot of having other voices. So you know, many of these elements here, uh, they are art pieces. In some cases, a little right. And one donor in particular who had a very substantial art collection and donated several pieces of very contemporary art to that temple. So that's, again, that it's really a, a home for these folks. In a way, it's why it's very personal. So these are the kind of things that are viewed in a lot of the work. Yeah, and again, it's it's really about, you know, working with texture, working with directly with material, materials, and um, there's always a sense of warmth that we're trying to, to put into these buildings. Um, there's a there's a Yiddish term, it's, it's Hamish, and it means, like, homely, cozy, and I think it's, like, the second word out of every congregation's mouth when we ask how they want the space to feel, they say they want it to feel Hamish. Um, and so, you know, we have been involved, either with artists or also, you know, in the firm with designing these pieces and then it's it's always a collaboration i would say right i mean it's never sort of just one or the yeah, other yeah, right absolutely yeah 
so there's so it's interesting because in that way it's like it's kind of in some ways getting back to an older form of architecture right where you're working directly with, with perhaps people and artists to put to put a building together um and these are just i mean these are just sort of some examples of what that is like you know working with the materials the um this was actually almost the first thing i did when i came to the firm i got thrown on this this setting up project that was already under construction and made an arc you know how I'm <laughs> It was an interesting project project um and then there's also again you can kind of again get this sense of memory here so for instance um the stone there's often a, a sense of wanting to reference jerusalem and the texture of the of the western wall we also always generally are working with congregations that have been around and so we always have hardened artifacts that we're trying to move you know from one location to another um so for instance like the stained stained glass pieces up here at temple beth setting were in their existing synagogue and we moved them, and they became a sort of integral part of the Bima um, wall, which was meant to be directly out to the woods. Um, but it really, you know, it sort of changed it from just being a view to, you know, a memory of where they had come from before. So a part of that, uh, I did have the privilege of one of these temples to, they wanted to actually have Jerusalem stone, so not just local stone, although there are many stones that looked like Jerusalem stone, they said, we want Jerusalem stone. So they flew me out to Jerusalem, um, and I worked with them to pick the stone. So this, this is one of the larger quarries in Jerusalem, and we went through various exercises, and, and with the owner too, and we said, all right, of all these various stones here, what are you drawn towards? And we went through all many samples, and though many of you were in fabrication looking at this stuff, but this was going to me, first time to Israel, it was really interesting. So I got to spend time not to, at the quarry, but touring around Israel. So. Uh, really interesting, and interesting enough, it was less expensive to purchase a stone there, ship it to the, in Omaha, Nebraska, than it was to find a local stone one state over, because the cost of labor is so much less in Israel than here, like half. Yeah. So that more than offsets the shipping, you know, the fabrication cost, so literally they save money buying it from Israel than doing it locally. And that project, interesting enough, was part of a much bigger project. So this um, part of Alma, Nebraska, they decided they wanted to create a tri-phase center. So they had three different phases come together in one side. The Muslim phase, the Christian phase, and the Jewish phase. And working with several designers and firms, local, the veteran and outside, and a landscape architect, they developed a sort of circle of Abraham in the, in, the, in the center of the site, and then these four buildings began to bring around that, that center. And then ironically, there's a creek running down the middle called Bells Creek. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was another really interesting part of this project was that not only we designed this, we were the first one on the block, yeah. but we were part of a much larger conversation around the project, center, which was actually one of the first ones in this nation, in the middle of the country, to actually bring three faces together because they wanted to have the ability to converse. They thought, we need to be able to dialogue together with other faiths. So they thought it was very important. And, and it was ironic, but maybe not so, that it was in the middle of the country that this happened, not on the coast, in the middle. And I think that says a lot in, in many respects. So anyways, I'm going to go to the next image. So there you can see the arrow view, our buildings in the foreground. And, and that, that is where we put the stone from Jerusalem in that site. And it used to be a former golf course, by the way, converted to this. Um, but, but again, there's a lot of powerful symbolism about here, about gathering, and about the collective community. So it's not just within our particular building, but all of them. But that, that became a very powerful kind of conversation. There's, there's the stone. <laughs> from, yeah. Not just in the building, but they became part of the Chapel amphitheater. Chapel on the amphitheater. Chapel on the amphitheater. Yeah. So um, we have two projects going on right now. This one is a really quick little thing, and then we'll dive into the details of Temple Israel. But we usually have more than one of these going because there's a, a big break in these projects. <laughs> you do concepts, and then they have to go off and raise a bunch of money. <laughs> you get to come back to it. I'm sure we're all familiar with the with projects, right? Wait, is this ever actually going to really happen? Yeah. So, um, Sweet so has never going to really happen. This is like what, try number five, maybe, with Temple Israel? Probably the longest in the firm over twice in the years. 20 years. Yeah. Um, so, this, this building. Is spectacular. I mean, there's just that there's no way to, to describe it. it. It's a very historic congregation on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, right? 
And this sanctuary is enormous. It seats like 1,300 or something. Right? In a normal mode. In a normal mode, in this sort of theater mode that you see here. Um, Martin Luther King spoke here in, late, in the um, late 60s, about a year before he was shot. Um, so, and the, the congregation has a very, very kind of long history around social justice and activism. And the problem is the building's really big. It's got a lot of issues. And anytime you touch it, you're going to spend a lot of money, right? As everybody can guess. And also the, the other big problem is that people don't worship this way anymore, right? They, they want to be in the round. They want to be together. They want flexibility. They want to think about all these different kind of modes. Um, this is really, you know, a, a much more an older traditional way of worshiping, but we have this beautiful space. Um, the you know the, the craftsmanship in this building is just kind of stunning. There's these gorgeous terrazzo floors, you know, bringing the sanctuary, nice chapel. Um, but there's also some things like this, <laughs> Betty Port Hall, which is like, I actually like to walk in like this and be like, hey, welcome to our wonderful religious community. Wasn't that the building? Yeah, not so much. Um, and then there's some really interesting, bizarre infrastructure. So this um, upside down Hershey's Kiss that you see here is at the top of that sanctuary. And you can see light kind of reflecting down. Believe it or not, it's the shape that comes out of the ceiling and it's hit with these incredibly bright spotlights and it diffuses light through the sanctuary in a way that's really just like, you've never seen anything like this before. Um, and don't ask. Yeah. Is it this very Yeah. So it's not. That's the crazy thing. Yeah. This building is not on the register. And they've been careful to not put it on the register. Um, but I will say that everything that we've looked at is not about modifying the outside, honestly, other than small, you know, modifications. It's really about yeah. changing the experience yeah. of the inside. So we're gonna show you our little video real quick. Um, and then because it kind of talks about what we're trying to do from the entry. Um really opening up. You saw that picture of that crazy kind of two-story height, like really not welcoming space. So the concept is, is that we're going to interfloor that space and have you come into a space that we call a community court that we're going to show you in Tulsa with this idea of like you come in, there's a welcoming area. Um, it's just like a quick little landscape, you know, video that we did for them to give a sense. Um, and then we'll go to back to that stair in a minute that goes up to a second floor social hall, right? Because the space there is like 30 something feet yeah, high. Oh. And it was that high because the back wall of the sanctuary, which is called the Bima, actually moves on rails so they could expand on high holidays. So this is the vision for the sanctuary, which is to flatten the floor and flip it. And flip it. Because the, the sanctuary actually right now faces west. Everyone wants them to face east. And then you'll be able to go up from the main kind of community court space of a gracious stair. Um, we're also like landlocked. So the skylight here is like hard up against, you know, our neighbor. Yeah. Five feet wide. Yeah, five feet. Yeah, exactly. So it's pretty tight. Yeah. And then you'll be able to have, you know, social hall space that's that's more properly usable and access from there. You'll be able to go up to a new balcony level within the sanctuary. And that's how they'll handle having 2,000 people at a service at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yeah which that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest challenges of these buildings is you can literally be doing things like on a Friday night on Shabbat, you might have 150, 200 people, and then you might have two, 3,000 at high holidays. So it's a very, it's a big challenge. Yeah, big challenge. So this is how we, so we added the seating here at the upper level um, within the sanctuary. Now, as you can imagine, that's going to, I mean, this is not an expensive project. So like I said, we, uh, we're waiting. <laughs> and in the meantime, we get to design a totally different, you know, probably 20,000 square foot new construction synagogue in Tulsa, Oklahoma, also in the middle of the, the, middle of the country. Um, and by the way, the way we get this work is that rabbis call rabbis and temple presidents know temple presidents. <laughs> in all honesty, it's small world of mouth, right? Small world. Small world. Um, so this, this project came to us um, basically because the rabbi there um, was toured through BJPE by myself at a convention in 2019. That, that year, that was a while back, right? So here we are. And just before, uh, COVID. Just before COVID. Yep. So this is the site. Um, it's a, it's kind of like at the edge of Tulsa. Um, most people have probably never been to Tulsa. We had not. It's very city, by the way, the recommended beautiful architecture, if you don't know. And um, this building was built in the 1950s by Percival Goodman, who we referenced before. Um, it sits 
in kind of an interesting spot. You can see there's the shopping plaza to the north. There's a commercial slash residential um, development to the west, which we will spare you the visuals of the architecture because it's really kind of scary. And then directly to the south, um, there is this large uh, Catholic preparatory school called Fashion Hall. So the site, the current site is about five plus acres. And that's important because we're actually going to, they're looking at selling part of the site to the neighbor to, as a part of the means of getting the money to do the actual project. Um, so when we were initially engaged, um, so this is, this is the existing building, right? And this gives you a sense of kind of where they're coming from and the, and the life of the congregation, and right? The first and this is the person we'll go to the synagogue. So one of the things you'll probably notice is, do you see any windows? Not so much, right? These buildings were very, very, very inwardly focused um, for a whole host of reasons. And one of the things that we always try to do is kind of break out of that, like, inward focus, right, in the, in the designs for the new buildings. Um, this would, these are just some of the goals that the congregation had. As you can see, there's light filled there, which they're not at the moment. <laughs> a lot of conversations with committees and individuals in the congregation. We have up to well over a dozen or two dozen meetings. Yeah. Talking with all stakeholders. So, yeah. so we always start with these sort of, you know, um, conceptual aspects. And, you know, if anyone works at universities, it's not unlike the, you know, have the meetings with all the different stakeholders, right? Um, except that these people are all volunteers. And this is the only time we will ever do this, right? As opposed to institutional owners who, of course, have, have been through this before. So we did a series of conceptual design options last year. Yeah, it started to start with, oh, can we take our existing building and transform it? You know, we have too much space. So we began to study various ways to rejigger that and hide it down and work within it. And so we went through, we can keep like a series of exercises. We tested this out. They thought, okay, that's interesting, but there's still some challenges. And then what would happen if we didn't work with the existing and build new on the adjacent side, which is just to the right of the existing, you can see the dashed outline of the existing footprint. And so we started to examine that. And then we had all different ways to reach and figure. And we'll get into that in a minute, but it tested a whole different way to reorganize the parts. And they began to get more convinced that this is a better idea. They're trying to work within what they have. So, um, and then we've been going through this exercise of testing various parts, looking at different ways to organize the program. And then from that, we generate a series of things called set of thinking. Um, we're back to touch briefly on the site division yeah. question here. So, so the, um, really what it comes down to is we had sort of come up with this idea of could we build next to where you are so that you can stay in the building? By the way, we have now abandoned staying in the building but we're still going to build next to where they are. Uh, but the idea was that, you know, the, the land is a great resource in terms of thinking about, you know, financial resources for them moving forward. They didn't really need the entire site anymore. Um, they had this very large schooling that had been constructed in the 1950s, and they just don't, the congregation is not sort of needing that anymore, right? And so they wanted, to Tony's point, to kind of shrink a bit, right, and get into a building that was more sort of right-sized for where they are now, um, which, interestingly enough, is growing, but is still not at the, at the scale that they were when the building was first built. Right. Um, so, however, we had a bunch of issues that we've run into <laughs> on this side of the site. Which is more, more conversations than not because it's yeah. not changing this. But anyways, we'll, we'll just very quickly fly through this. So, yep. we did a big series of um, imaging for them, and you can see here, this is the replacement on their existing site with the one-story, 20,000 square foot, synagogue. And here again, the idea was trying to create a sense of arrival in what we've called often the community coordinate that all which come through courtyard and then you have a blaze wall looking in towards the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the idea we we're trying to embed the, you know, as much sustainability using uh, wood if we can, even we do want to keep the stone from the existing temple if we can, um, into the new design. And one of the key things on this that we're going to point out, in the principal Goodman um, synagogue, there's these magnificent stone are tablets on the exterior. Concrete. They're con cast concrete. Um, there. It's right here. So we're exploring removing those from the existing, and they're 40 feet high, from the existing temple, and then relocating them into what we call the sacred gardens from within, which, which you can see on the far right. Here. There. So it becomes a sculpture element, but also when you get into the worship space, you actually have a view back towards those tablets. So the idea is you open up the end wall and as the director said, transform the inside so this is much more light fills. 
as opposed to hermetically inward focus. So it's a, it's a foot in the thinking about how to do this um, project. And from the street perspective, it's actually a very simple building. It's just a series of simple volumes. Uh, but you're trying to make the organization very legible in terms of you open up three parts, house of worship, house of learning, and house of gathering. So we try to organize these components architecturally um, as well as programmatically. So that's what you're kind of seeing volumes represent the different uses. So we did that last year. There was they had extremely successful fundraising. Um, so this project, you know, moved frankly at a speed that we're kind of not used to the synagogues. So here we are, basically a year after we did the con, like first started the concept and looked at some different options. We also actually we studied some other sites too. They looked at buying some other buildings, and, and luckily we didn't want to have to convert another office building into a synagogue. <laughs> so we we started with like that that scheme that we just showed you in terms of kind of where we were at schematic design. So we just started schematics. Which, my God, it's like only a month ago. Yeah, just month ago. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see, you can really get a sense here, this is the division of the site, right? So everything that's not colored is the land that's being sold so well. to the adjoining um, owner. And so then we had to start dealing with some really big issues around things like stormwater easements. Um, there's an enormous, they call it the box, which I think is kind of hilarious. Um, so basically, as it turns out, this building, the original building, is built in an old creek bed. Okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and underneath the ground, running basically, unfortunately, like straight through where we're trying to put the building, is a 120-inch by 160-inch concrete box that takes excess stormwater flow underneath obviously we can't build a building on top of that because in theory at some point the city might have to come dig it up although whenever that's going to happen it's a really big question right so the engineers um who we're working with who are of course local by the way that's another thing with these projects like we always work with local engineering consultants for obvious reasons right um are looking at shifting that box way over to the east and so that's you know we had this kind of initial lines you know these dashed lines here of like okay where can we where can we move the box now but we we then we discovered we did have a problem <laughs> which is that you know we had those stone tablets there and they're like well they're going to consider that a structure that's going to be in that easement and we can't do that so and also you know you start having conversations and um in all honesty, one of the like really initial difficult conversations you always have is with security consultants of these buildings because they are targets, like straight up. And so one of the things we started looking at is kind of like pulling the building back, right, from these from the edges of the site. You can see here that you know that eastern area is like pretty close to the to the, to the road. Yeah. So probably get a sense of like, okay, so we've been shifting, right? We've sort of been sort of pulling the plan in. And looking at some sort of reorganization, yeah, and tightening it up. Tightening it down. Yeah, and, and and also you can see now there's this kind of like bigger like green buffer, if you will, right, to the north and the east of the building. North is actually up on the plans, um, and just kind of you know re like just reworking, right, the, the approach that we were taking to that. Um, so and actually that it it really has had some benefits. I feel like among other things, you know, this this sacred garden that we like to create outside the sanctuary is kind of feels more like it's of the, of the building now and we have a little more space to play with, right? Um, so this is this is the current uh, plan. Yeah, as of this week. Yes, yeah. as of like two days ago. Um, and just to talk a little bit about the organization of the building, so folks know what we're looking at, right? So um, to Tony's point, we have three functions, which is house of worship, which is house of gathering, and which is house of learning. So uh, our main... Our main spaces for Betikila, our house of worship, right, are here in the sanctuary. And then you'll see directly adjacent to the sanctuary is something that we like to call the Kibbutz Court. Um, and this is for gathering. So you probably saw that floor plan of like the original building is very long. Um, this is how all uh, synagogues were built in the 50s and 60s to deal with that expansion. Is you would like open a back wall of the sanctuary and you would see people, I love Mo's term for this, you'd be like, the chief sheets were in Siberia, right? So imagine like you, you, you know, buy your ticket to come to high holidays and you're like 300 feet back from the ark and, and the rabbi and everything that's happening, right? 
So the idea was to create this kind of central gathering court, right? And that was also a, a reference back to the sort of, you know, biblical description of the temple in terms of having the idea of three courts, and the original temple not from Jerusalem. So that creating that court is sort of meant to be the second court. The first court is like when you first come to the site. So we always try to create a precinct and a sense of arrival and that transition, right? So we have that here where we have this transitional area, the Galleria, and then you come to the court, the community court, and then you go to the center. So that sort of flow of sort of preparing yourself for worship is, is part of the design. Um, the other major elements are a little bit more straightforward, right? There's always an administrative area, there's staff, there's rabbis, uh, people that have to be, um, you know, there every day, people that congregants meet with. We always try to place the administrative area very close to one, one entry, and we always have one main entry. And that's both to kind of create this experience, but it's also a gift of security. So that there are people there all the time and they can understand what's happening who's coming and going from the building, right? And then we have this kind of small classroom wing and a youth area, so this is, this is for children, but it's also, you know, we say classroom, but um, these buildings have to be multi-purpose. So these are just really classrooms, meeting rooms, right? And can be used for different purposes. And then in the center of the building, we do have this outdoor courtyard, which has these meeting rooms arrayed around it. And we have what we call the Beit Midrash, um, uh, traditionally a Beit Midrash in um, a shul, as it would be traditionally known. Um, is a place where people actually meet and review and do things like debate the law and the Talmud. Um, there is a lot of sort of scholarly input into that, but also this room is really a chapel, right? So it's a small worship space, it's a meditation space. And so we have that smaller area placed here, really at the heart of the building, um, which is one of the things actually that this room did for us, right? Is it allowed us to sort of place that um, there in that sort of central space. Okay. Are you getting on? I think I'm getting the other right there. Yeah. I, I know we're, for you guys, what we were trying to get, you know, I know we have a lot of conversation with you. So, a lot of studies revolve around testing to capacity. That's a big issue. How much do you get during the service high over the service? A lot of ways to test diagrams. We're doing, of course, what's evolved now. The way many things are remote, and which in this case is fortunate. We don't have to always fly to Tulsa. So, but doing concept board, we do a lot of this kind of sketching over a concept board meetings and live drawings on top of it and like the next series image just show us shows us literally diagramming right with them right so they said what about move this move that suggest this but if you do that so we're live um like we normally would be if you had trace from people so it's the trace on the computer screen that they're manipulating through and then we test you know very simple massing diagrams and say well what about this could we shape the volumes differently what about turning it this way that way so we start to show them like conceptual diagramming on this. Um, you know, how do we deal with the idea of um, placing and what happens to orientation next? And you know, more and more feedback constantly going at it. Well, would you shift this this way? And what about that moving that way? So this live way of interacting, and then of course, since that's what we record everything, and then we can document these series of notational gestural moves. Um, and next, these, these last series ones are the most current um, sketches that we can. Conceptualizing. So one of the key things with the stone tablet, the, the concrete, 40 feet tall, and we realized we may have a sightline issue. So what if we begin to change the ceiling? And so the, the rendering showed it was kind of very simple flat. Well, but maybe we might want to think about stepping it or angling it, because with you're in that space to draw your eye towards that and then not cut off part of the text on that, we really start to get into, well, we need to really study this team eventually because we don't want to have anyone sitting there. Like, I can't see the top of the, you know, the Ten Commandments because I just cut it off. So that's... They're not eight, they're ten. They're ten. So <laughs> that's started to get at this, and we're we're really early on right now conceptualizing, but this is the kind of thinking, which now that we're going into SD phase and, you know, and just these the very quick, loose sketches, overlaying those renderings in order to test the beginning idea. So you start to think about, you know, okay, volumetric piece starts to do that. The next thing is, you know, maybe the planes start to create a stronger read volumetrically instead of just one simple volume, maybe it breaks down in scale. It starts to celebrate this idea of ascension and second movement. Um the next few I think I'll wrap it up. Um and then just sketches overlaying like when you come in there you still want to see it and then this next sketch says, okay, this is what you really want to have happen. So but you're in there you need to see the top of it, right? You can see the previous rending underneath, cuts it off. So this is now 
where we are. And I know we've been presenting for a while here. Um, so I just want to open up for comments, questions, discussion, ideas, what anybody you say. So this is, this is what we've been doing. Um, this is very great. Thank you. I, I am taking notes and have a lot of sort of big picture question, but I'll let everyone else come in, but I have one very specific question I'll ask first, which is, have, has there been any discussion of converting the box to a visible rain garden water storage element that yes. could be planted and not a not an yeah. underground concrete bunker? Yes. So the problem, so here's here's the issue, right? Is that um, it connects into like this bigger system, right? Yeah. So they this uh, this underground stream, if you will, like we kind of have to restore it, right? Because otherwise it would get cut off. Yeah. But we have an interesting opportunity though, where um, we have to move the floodplain okay. as part of kind of like dealing with the runoff, right? Our building here, and there we were definitely talking about having an exterior like bioswale rain garden area so that um we can use that for like the mitigation of the additional load we're putting as mm -hmm. opposed to um having to make an even bigger underground box <laughs> so, yeah it's that we've it's sort of like there's a small opportunity but not a big opportunity it's following your question there's a awesome thing thing about tulsa and we're about to speak of this um as our sustainable practice leader they are significantly behind they got 2004 international energy Care. so all the things that we're really interested here exactly there's not even anywhere close to talking about but at the same time we are pursuing ground source heat pumps so yeah. it's a, it's an interesting um, place to work yeah i wonder if you get somebody like i don't know i assume your civil was a local yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you could bring in somebody like the the bio habitats folks or something uh, yeah. with them to sort of coax them into yeah uh, I th more creativity. I think that we'll be able to do some nice work with the landscape and stuff. Yeah. I think that um, what we sort of heard from them loud and clear was like the city's going to want that that time, yeah. right? So. I think there's like a there's a, like a level that we can kind of move. I mean, the, but with the energy code, for instance, like when I started working stuff out with the engineers, like a first call, I think they laughed and they said, "Oh, but we don't worry about the code." And I'm thinking, like, where are you going with this? Yeah. And then they said, "No, here's the deal. We're on 2004." And I was like, "Excuse me, I need to pick myself up off the floor." And they said, "So we do what's right." And I was like, "Okay, so at least we're kind of like in the same zone here of discussion, but you know." It's it's a different it's a different environment. So, other comments? Um, yeah, I think it's really cool uh, process and project here. I'm always interested in the dynamic between. Uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier about the security mm -hmm. and introducing more light, making it more outward like this. So, um, I don't know if you can see to it or not, but just like what are some of the kind of special considerations, especially now that it's kind of um, okay, good question. It's, so, you know, I think if we if we talk, you know, back to kind of the plan, right, and the organization of the building. Um, so as we mentioned, I mean, it sounds like pedantic, but the single point of entry has always been really important, right? And so that, and having the eyes of the administration there, um, which also is just better functionally. We often, the joke with these buildings always, right, was there was like a main entry to the 1950s building with a sign that said, go around to the back. Yeah. So we try to make like one point of entry. Um, also, we are always looking at setbacks from streets. Um, we have to have really difficult conversations about how we handle things like vehicle ramming, um, vehicle borne explosives, all that type of thing. And it always comes down to like an incredible trade-off right where people and usually what people will say is we don't want to build a new fortress right and we do want to be more outward looking but then we do think about for instance like where do we put the glazing right yeah. and like landscape landscape is a big part yeah. 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 yeah exactly so like this move again where we were sort of able to pull like kind of back from the streets yeah, i think the things that um, the human eyes on is your best defense. I mean, how many security systems do you try to incorporate, whether cameras, defense walls, this and that? There's only so much. If somebody's 
unfortunately in today's world, determined to create um, havoc or destruction. Your best line of defense is first spotting that individual before they even get to the building. Um, is, can you make like conversations we have at schools? School projects, right? those you've done school projects, we're doing courthouses. Yeah. All the time this comes up. Um, and, and I think to your point, the landscape is a huge part. We're already talking about how you create differential in grade and, and doing other things along the edge of the building to help. Uh -huh. So then, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then also we, and then we kind of do get in eventually to the nitty gritty of, for instance, like, the, as you can see, we like to use a lot of glass in our sanctuaries, right? Um, because we want, you know, to let as much natural light in as possible. But this will be out to this idea of, of this garden, right? Which is beyond. There'll be another wall. Right, surrounding the garden. Surrounding the garden. Which will be of? You know, of some kind. Yeah. And also, I see a lot of clear story on this, which yeah. Yeah. Is, like, must be like two things. Yeah, we're also well. introducing yeah. that, so. Yeah, but then the, also the, I feel like the, the interior courtyard was also another thing that we were trying to do with this one. Um, like, you know, having this, like, yeah. actually the rendering shows it probably better. But yeah, so the introduction of the space in the heart of the building, right, here, so that that's, of course, captured, right? But uh, the idea is that this will let in you know, an enormous amount of light. We actually got a lot of, there were some congregants who reacted actually pretty negatively to some of these conceptual renderings that it was too much glass. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's like all of us architects, right? We start with like, let's make it as open as we can. And then we kind of, you know, well, yeah. Oh, yes. do, they, do they get concerned about being like watch? You know, like yes. Your gym, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. I think part of that too is probably fed into the very intimate nature that religion holds. Yeah. And in those spaces, as open and beautiful as it is, sometimes people want the sense of privacy yeah. that less glass might hold. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and for instance, actually, like the, that middle space, the Bateman Drosh, is actually pretty kind mm -hmm. of, it's more inward like, focused. small, inward focused, yeah, you know, the, than the sanctuary. So, um, you know, the, the location of it, and then I think you get a little sketch even here, kind of in the sense. So, that sort of solid area that Tony kind of penciled in is like sort of just outside the Bateman Drosh, and then that would just mm -hmm. have some blazing up to like the internal courtyard. Mm -hmm. Um, so that there, yeah, you could go in and be much more kind of enveloped, if you will, right, in a space. And the other times we face some of these projects, there's a lot of memory, which means a lot of artifact. You can imagine, like, you're moving, like, you move from one home to another, right? How much we'll stuff do you bring? Like 100. 100. <laughs> and sometimes that can be very kind of judicious and diplomatic and saying, well, maybe should we consider, like, bringing that piece of because there's a lot of families tied to that, memory yeah. tied to that, and we have to find a way to control the bringing of everything over. So yeah. It's an yeah. Oh. But it's also like, if, if it doesn't feel um, like they're, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, if you can imagine, like, I mean, to me, so I was, you know, I was raised in a very church going family, but they were a good Methodist family. So I remember the first time I went to like a cathedral when I was a kid in Europe, and I was like, there's all this color and detail and like all the all these things, right? It's like it's not a cathedral without, you know, maker list, right, of the architectural elements. And so I think for a lot of people, like it's not a synagogue if there are not a lot of these particular artifacts. And you know, there's not the silver crowns from like, the previous five Torah and like all these things kind of on display and out there for people to see. It won't feel like a Jewish space, you know. So that's like another thing we have to weigh is again like how much space to make for that versus you know probably our more of our inclination right which is to create kind of clean quiet spaces that people can just be in. And also that I think as a project I've you know many of you folks have worked with a lot of different clients, a lot of different buildings, but I will say that working for the Lewis Institution I think is a very special client. It's not like working for other types of clients, and I think it's because they've done so much of their spirituality, their connections, it's very personal. Um, it's not, in some ways, like, well, it's just interchangeable with something else. So we're really designing a home, you know, like, for a congregation. And as Rebecca said, it's, they're going to do it one time. They're not going to do this multiple times. 
So we kind of have to get it right. Um, so it's very, very personal involvement, which can be intense. And oh, yeah. you get a lot of opinions. I mean, we all say you have 10 people in the room, but you have 20 opinions. Oh, yeah. It was just true. But I think people are very passionate. So I think for us, it's a, I would say it's a really special building type to work on. I think working on a lot of different projects. I think designing houses works are probably really special. You know, have the honor or opportunity to do that. I agree. I love these projects. And are, are they open to the new ideas, like doing something different from the standard? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think so. They are. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fun. And I think they, I think they have sort of like concepts from the space yeah. that they want to carry through. But yeah, I think they're they're open to any and everything. Actually, better. Sorry. Did you have to? Um, like um, how you integrated the challenge of Shabbat day that they have restrictions, they cannot use light or electronics or or access point, mm -hmm. but also for how the building. Uh, so so this is so so we have worked with different, as we say, denominations of Judaism, right? So. Uh, for instance, we did a study a number of years back for a modern Orthodox congregation. There will be no operation of lights, none of that, right, on Shabbat. Uh, if you work for conservative congregations, which we've done a lot of, it's somewhere in the middle. So, for instance, the um, so like the TBT, uh, it's a little bit in New York, um, there was to be no amplification of the human voice in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So we can get into a lot of very fine acoustical detailing, we use a Sentec, um, for all these projects um, to think about, you know, how do you how do you then project the human voice? This is a reform congregation. So, in terms of uh, what, in terms of the halakhic restrictions of the law, it's really more toward things like kashrut and like you know creating the kitchen so it's kosher, you know, um, and not so much about the doing of work. Right, that's a that's less of a consideration in these buildings, but but that's always a, a kind of a out of the gate, you know, discussion is what what are the restrictions? How are we thinking about what can and can happen on Shabbat and those types of things? In the beginning, you had that wooden uh, synagogue structure from Eastern Europe, and you talked a little bit about using the past to inform your design for the future. Um, and it's interesting that you know, a lot of those, most of those structures were destroyed, and then yeah. most of the synagogues in the U.S. are from the night toward that and onward. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so you have two completely different design philosophies, but you talked about, you know, using that historic, um, yeah. those buildings to inform your current choices, potentially. One of the things did, about, yeah. did, you, did you incorporate it? So, yeah. yeah, one of the things about those, uh, especially in most of them are Poland, um, they were often very centralized and very regularly in square. Also, the worship in many cases were more in a in a special way than sitting on the side and then you know the the clergy that were removed. Like what so some of that and of course craft and scale, and those were beautiful synagogues that were all hand built, you know, by local they didn't, probably didn't have an architect, I'm sure they didn't. And so they're all but built on the foundation of folk tradition of buildings. So and they just passed it on from one to the next. So yeah. for us, I, I think the in the sense of intimacy. Yeah. So yeah. like you can see the seating arrangement here, right? This is we're often going back to more right. in the rest, right? So this so this rectangle here represents um the reading table for the Dima. So this is where the Torah scroll is opened, right? And the, the rabbi and anyone who has come up to read from the Torah or participate in service will be placed. And you can see that there's a little dash line too of it shown in front of the ark. So the, the cabin at the end there is the ark where the scrolls are kept. And so the, the scroll will be brought out at different points, right, and opened onto the bimah. And to Tony's point, traditionally there was this sort of like movement of the clergy from like that center point in the middle, in the middle with people sitting all around to the front with the ark. But then when um, particularly reform Judaism, which sought to really kind of integrate themselves into society in the U.S., you know, there are synagogues out there that look just like churches. Sure, yes. And they were set up, and they even would worship on Sunday sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, most of, <laughs> that's, that's sort of gone back, and people now are back to sort of worshiping on Friday and Saturday, right? Um, but that kind of, you know, that frontal, you know, processional setup, that's a, that's a Christian setup, right? So this setup here with more of in the round of people sitting and being involved in like working with the worship leader, 
is the more traditional setup. So when we think about how we set up our sanctuaries, we are often going back more to that it approach. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, in those buildings, I think we have the TBT picture, right, in the craft section. So that, um, those buildings were very simple, as we noted, right, in form. And interestingly enough, um, they were, on the outside, they were like plain wood, right? And you can see that kind of sort of, you know, build up. And the reason that you had that, like, so that lower level, by the way, that's where the men went in. And the women went in another door on the outside and were often in a balcony, right? Because you had the separation of the sexes traditionally. Um, Orthodox and modern Orthodox shul will still do that in different ways, right? So you see that really simple form and the use of wood, because of course they were all just made from wood. But the interesting thing is the insides of these buildings were painted yeah. elaborately and with like so many colors, oh. right? Like just incredible, you know, um, artwork. So when we did Temple Beth Sedek in um, New York, you can see that here, this stained glass was our reference to that color. So this is a this is very much that kind of square setup. I mean, this the setup for the we will admit we borrow that we might borrow and steal from all of our previous projects, right? So the sanctuary here is is in many ways kind of model like TBT. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's certain ways you can organize worship, but there are variations on the scene. Yeah. So I'm curious. I <clears throat> Long ago, saw the picture on just some synagogue designs, and and I don't seems still to generally hold true. But that was the one of the things they were talking about was how like, there really is no synagogue technology in the way that there is now. Yeah, cathedrals are all in Crusoe, yeah. and, yeah. and then a lot of that comes from this like, nomadic tradition of Judaism, where it forced out of one land and travel to the next, and sort of adopt the the culture. So. And, Architecture of the place that we're in, and I think that so it makes a lot of sense that, for example, the, the artifacts are really important, right? Because those are the things that, that you can break up, come, come with you. But, and so, I guess I'm, I'm curious one, are there sort of consistent themes and rules and ideas that you all have developed and that you, that you have started to bring as sort of consistent approaches or typologies to synagogues you design, and also. How much do you look to the local vernacular to say, okay, we're, we're not, you know, we part of the role of the synagogue is to become a part of the local community. So we're building building traditions and, and we're going to purposely diverge in these areas, but, but try to be consistent in these. Yeah, I think that the, the, there are absolutely some guiding principles that we do uh, apply and we ask. We don't just like a stick, but um, as Rebecca said, for instance, the separation of the secular from the sacred, and often it is like three portals leading into the sacred. Um, that's number one. Number two is the sense of what they call image. So that sense of intimacy, I think it's really important. It speaks to how they want to worship and be together as a congregation. I think we do try to imbue a lot of the local feel. So here in Tulsa, they have some very beautiful stone, fortunately, which is quite inexpensive which they have a lot of in abundance out there. So we're, we're looking at that. And a lot of the buildings in Tulsa, you know, it, it is a pretty flat Midwestern city. So the idea of the, in some ways, almost a recollection of the prairie, the black buildings that sort of nestle in. I think these are things and we absolutely want to understand what are the local things that people think and they say, but oh, that is Tulsa. That's Oklahoma. This is... Yeah. yeah. He, 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 I'm not sure we've ever worked with a congregation that doesn't go to Redwoods to Jerusalem series. But as we said, TI was the only yeah, place where we actually came from Jerusalem. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, in Dallas, right, we used a Texas limestone. Texas limestone, yeah. Um, we've used so stone. Uh, so stone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, BJBE, we actually used slate. Yeah. This sort of like texture of slate. Um, so there's that sense of that texture, but then we, it's adapted, right, depending on like yeah. the situation. And the other, um, another, the sense of these three courts, right? This this idea of the community court of kind of coming into the central gathering space was really something that yes. was sort of like that's a break, right, from that kind of 1950s like long 
you know, continuous space. Um, we will say we usually actually try to avoid what we're doing here, which is we are going to have a back wall that opens for expansion. We usually have done trying to do balconies. We try to do you know, pods, around. pods, like all kinds of different yeah. strategies. But this back wall will not be just like a hotel wall. We're looking at doing like a glazed, you know, sort of more custom um, installation, right? So that we can do things, for instance, like integrating text. So that's another one of yeah. our yeah, principles is this what we call the integration of the art and the history, right? So it's probably something like, that's why we sort of talked about the craft, right? So that's that's one of our principles that we try to bring. Um, and it also talks about the Jewish text, uh, which is very significant, um, and they have different things tied to worship. And so sometimes we, in one of the synagogues we, in, in, in Omaha, the one that had in Joseph Stone. So the whole upper section is built out of the kind of uh, glass that's insulated that's a lantern and then separating the glass and the stone is this band of text so the text rings around the entire sanctuary based on a quote that they wanted to incorporate and the only conversation was should it face towards the sanctuary in fact or face out when you, you read it from the outside or from the inside well that was in a self-interesting conversation yeah how you write the text yeah. and i will say that the, the rabbis are really intelligent very intelligent so you know we, we talk about like what the guy the principles are that we bring with them. Like, I feel like these quotes are quotes are different. Yeah. Um, so, like, at BJBE, for instance, like, there's several places. Like, when you come into the community court, um, there's, um, on one side of these arches that we create, it says faith, hope, and love, and then the opposite side, it says it in Hebrew. Right? And so, everywhere there, where there's Hebrew text, there's also English, because they're how I wanted it to be very accessible to, like, mixed families, for people who don't know as much Hebrew. Um, things like that, right? So that kind of, um, that I, I just feel like there's always that kind of imbuing of the symbolism and, you know, particular numbers that are important. So you see things like, you see things like 13, the 13 attributes of God. You'll see um, pi is an important number, which is 18. So you'll see that kind of embedded yeah, throughout the same you know, I'm it's quite a lot. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, so those are the kind of, like, we have those conversations and some of those things will never, like, be obvious to anybody other than maybe the rabbi and the congregants when they talk about it, right? But it's all there. It's all put into the to the design. I was in a later process right now, like we said, we're trying to figure out the sanctuary scale and how we how we make the massing work yeah. over there. <laughs> we're having conversations about the demographics of what the, con what the congregation is now and what it expects to yeah, be, yeah. what it hopes to be, and yeah. how you assign yes. your program sizing. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's that drives all these projects, right? It's like how many families? What's the growth pattern? Where do people live? I mean, there there are companies that specialize in surveying populations to figure out where the Jewish population is located, because there aren't yeah. it's not a big population, you know. So it's, it's like as people move, like that's one of the things that drives actually some of these buildings changing, right? Like the population was in like these five suburbs, now they're over here, and. You know, especially for instance, if you have a conservative group who people want to still be able to walk on on Sabbath, right? Like the building needs to be in the neighborhood where people are located. Right? And so things move around. Uh, it even gets down to like the uh, of Chicago, the uh, very healthy social action. Yeah. Now, oftentimes these foundations are really social action oriented. So she wanted to make sure as we were producing these things, like you've got to make sure you're know, representing the, you know, right? I mean, we all do renderings. But it's very particular. Like you need to have more of this kind of representation. You don't have enough diversity. You don't have enough this. You're not showing enough. Behavior. You're not showing enough ethnic diversity. Our congregation needs to speak to a much wider group. So it's very important that you represent in your renderings who we're actually speaking to. So they they get very um, particular about that. Any other? How the construction the construction phase goes? Do they try to bring uh, people from the community also to build, or it's more an open? Well, we had one synagogue, and that was one of the first ones in Omaha that came after the Holocaust. So that congregation member was the head of the contracting firm, and this contracting firm ended up building the temple. He he, he waived over his typical contractor fee. It's his contribution to the project. So that's the only one that I'm aware of. Yeah, there, there are some things that happen, though, I feel like in, like, maybe not, like, the construction of the whole thing, but so, for instance, um, I mentioned how at BGB we had to face the sanctuary layers. So, for instance, the ark 
is constructed of walnut that there was a congregant who had this property in northern Wisconsin and he was harvesting trees and so he dried it and like that tree is what's in the ark, right? Um, we've had uh, the, in a, in a, in a synagogue, one of the areas that you have is what's known as the yard site. So there's a special observance that people do on the day of the passing of like a direct family member, like say a mother or a sibling, right? And there are these plaques that are always put up in the synagogues with the names. And um, we often have to move them or remake them, right? When we shift locations. So at uh, at Senec, the Brotherhood, which is the you know the, the men's group, actually came and like we had the walls done and they actually put all the plaques in when they when they moved, right? So there's it's more like small things like that, I would say, where people sort of participate, but. But we did, we haven't ever done like a like a barn raising. I would actually love to do that. Yeah. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, to have something <laughs> happen like that at some point, but we're not quite there yet. Can you get glass to span that entire wall? It's not that big. No. Um, how wide are we? Like <laughs> the raising area yeah, is yeah. probably on the order of um, 30, 30 feet. Yeah, the height is. Oh, it's probably 30 feet tall. Yeah. Of class and 30 feet wide. It's really nice to draw things without mullions. It's probably for your structure. structure. Yeah. We'll, we'll figure, figure it out when we get there. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I, know, I did these sketches like 20 minutes before minutes coming to this yeah, meeting. Exactly. Tonight, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it'll, it's obviously, you know, we have to consider that. And, there will be the other trick is there'll probably be um we'll probably do a um a retainage film on at least a portion of the glass because of security. Yeah. Um again in an unfortunate reality, right? Um but I'll have to think about that. Right. The budget is um the budget is limited, mm -hmm. but you get a lot for your dollar in Tulsa. Did it is anyone here like priced out geo recently in this area? Okay, so yeah, a well, say a 500 foot well, 35 to 50 can, yeah, okay, single, you know, single bore, 5 to 10 pull something. Yeah, exactly. Just like contemplate that for like five seconds. So they were like, oh, yeah, like, oh, it's going to be over money, blah, blah. And then like you start talking to the driller, and I was like, did you miss a zero? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, quarter the clock here, you know, give a drill of out. Yeah, I mean, it's just, no, interestingly though, um, not to geek out on the sustainability, but uh, because it's a cooling loaded um, environment, uh, we will eventually overcharge the ground and we'll actually have to pull heat out. So what they do is like, we'll set up to have a, a potential to put a chiller in in about say 30 years, probably when we overcharge the ground too much. And then they'll actually just like pull it out during heating season and, and project some of it into the air. And it can literally like kind of get your battery back, if you will, it's like recharging a battery. Right, which is kind of remarkable. I mean, that would never happen here in the Northeast for a totally different, you know, geology, climate type, everything. But yeah, we see that kind of push was Midwest as well as tornado. Yeah, so that's kind of big in the Midwest, as you've probably seen. So we have to create certain areas that are, um, you know, sort of. Yeah, we're not making like a, a shelter, shelter like right. that level, but a couple of the rooms will have be turned yeah. just in case of something and people can go in there. Like as a local tornado shelter? No, or like like say that people are there. Yeah, well that's... goes out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. not like a... Um, not like everyone in the neighborhood no. goes yeah, through that exactly. as a shelter. Yeah. yeah, no, a lot of those are usually established in schools. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. And like not to pull, like FEMA has a school standard for how you make those things and we're not going kind of to that level. Um, but at least it's like a little bit more, you know, protection and part mm -hmm. of the building. Um, and speaking of which, the, the concrete tablets, yeah. I have to really think about that. Wind. <laughs> 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 sales. Yeah. So that'll be a fun uh, yeah. exercise yeah. for an engineer. Yeah. I'm interested to know, uh, what is the post Facebook footage of these explosions? Mm. So we're looking, so... We talked about that storm box, right? So as you can imagine, we have a huge amount of site development, right? And then we've got um, demo needs the same building. I think the abutter is going to take that on. Um, and then brand new construction of about 20,000 square feet. We've been quoted 12 million. So pretty good number, right? For all of it. For all of it. Yeah, probably be two hundred square. square. And, and that's the whole, you know, like everything. a good size landscape allowance, like everything. 
So it's, it's definitely a different order of magnitude, you yeah. know, than we're all dealing with this area. It'd probably be 800. Yeah, it's a 900. 900 here, you know. We're, we're down to courthouse now, I mean, that's getting yeah, really into 900 square foot range. Yeah. So that's quite different. For construction business, we're the architects. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we, have be, we have to be efficient. Part of it moves fast, and they decide fast. So, that, so yeah. I'm on the Chicago one, which is like, that is coming in like 20 years on that project, and it's gone through five rabbis and in the like interim. Eight year. iterations. Eight iterations. <laughs> they own a lot out there, but they have a hard time deciding what to do. And but yeah. you have know, a big congregation. You know, the other thing the Buffett said, it's yeah. a lot easier to fundraise for a ground up brand new building than to fundraise for a renovation adaptive years because the dollars like flowing people want to not that this could be necessarily that but people want to sign like if i'm donating a million dollars i can donate to chapel oh all the spaces are named yeah, they're named like already versus like, 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 like but i'm not naming the mechanical system upgrades right yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> 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 Which is unfortunate because people show up. That's a huge amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they they have a this uh, only something like one point eight percent of the population in Tulsa is Jewish, but apparently in the last five years they've been something like seventy percent of the philanthropic dollars. Yeah. There's a huge, um, beautiful park. Oh, uh, the out, park is gorgeous. Which is, which is, like, yeah, I think you should also, check it out. The gathering place yeah. as well. Then, and of that, uh, a Jewish family donated a huge chunk. Huge chunk. So, philanthropically, the, even though they're very small, but they have an outsized level of contribution. Mm -hmm. And in the Jewish faith, they're also very much about giving back. So, this is very much in their um, psyche, as it were. Yeah. So, there, so, there are some resources, even within typical synagogues. I, I would say that congregation wise, they, they fundraise for everybody, but there's probably Less than five or ten percent of the families that is from the one in in Israel, the Jerusalem Stone. Ten percent of the that group donated nine percent of the funding for that synagogue, and the rest of the population nine percent donated ten percent of the money. So it does happen that there are some very very wealthy families and individuals who donate the bulk of the the resources to build these projects. So it's not say the donor design approach, but which is always you know can be a challenge. Usually, usually people are. Pretty good. Pretty good. Occasionally, there's moments. There's, there's some pretty strong personality. Yeah. <laughs> we all make the name, but one of them was involved in the Omaha Steak family. If you know the Omaha Steaks, as you say, advertise. So that family was one of the congregation members. And they were not the wealthiest, by the way, in that group. <laughs> it creates an interesting yeah, conversation. Anything else? Thank you so much. It's been super interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.